Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to uh, what is now session eight of this April governing body meeting. Um, as you were told earlier on, we were anticipating that uh, Simon Lloyd, the lay secretary, would be here in Brecon Cathedral with us. But unfortunately, he had a problem with his car. So he is uh, back or well, hasn't even left Cardiff. Sorry about that. But I do have Bishop Andrews and Bishop Banga uh, here with me. Plus, um, as a bit of a surprise, some members of my family. It's good to see them. Can I thank the Dean and the Cathedral staff for making this space um, available to us for this final uh, session? It does feel slightly better uh, doing something like this in surroundings of this nature rather than sat in my rather untidy study. Anyway, we move um, on uh, our order paper to item 21, uh, farewells. There's one senior cleric uh, who will be retiring before the next meeting of the governing body, as we've already heard during the course of our meeting, and that's Archdeacon Peggy Jackson. Uh, Peggy has been uh, in the church in Wales since 2009, where she came to us to become uh, Archdeacon of Llandaff. Uh, Peggy studied history at Somerville College in Oxford and became a chartered accountant. We can't help that. Some of us were lawyers, some of us were accountants. I know which I prefer, Peggy, but there we are. That's uh, good news for you that you were uh, able to serve in that way, gaining experience of life before entering uh, ordained ministry. Uh, Peggy was ordained deacon in 1987 and then priest in 1994. She served in a number of parishes in the Church of England until her appointment to Llandaff, as I've said, in 2009. She served as archdeacon whilst also looking after a number of parishes in the diocese. And in the province, she served on the Standing Committee, the Appointments and Business Subcommittee. She's been a chair of uh, the governing body. But I guess that perhaps Peggy is best known for the way in which she has been one of the champions of women's representation in the church, especially at senior level. Peggy, you've made a significant contribution to discussions in the church in Wales in a variety of ways, the governing body and elsewhere. And we now have women ordained both to priesthood and the episcopate here. Can I wish you well? Can I thank you very much indeed for all that you have done for us here in the province and wish you uh, very well indeed for your retirement after July. Peggy, do you wish to respond? I've got a note saying that you, you may wish to. I'll take an indication from others in Cardiff as to whether you're going to uh, or not. Peggy, could you raise your hand if you'd like to speak, please? That's a good idea. Thank you, Simon, for that. Uh, I have just done so. Um, am I? I am live, am I? <laughs> I'm being heard. Um, uh, well, I wasn't expecting to speak, Archbishop, but um, oh. thank you so much for your very kind words. Um, I might say... Uh, being in Wales has been the most extraordinary experience for me and a, a, a wonderful um, way to uh, come to the, towards the end of my ministry. Um, it's felt like a privilege all the years I've been here. Uh, and I feel as if I've been part of the church in Wales through a most exciting period when women have uh, come into the episcopate. And uh, as we've been hearing at this governing body, the church in Wales is uh, changing um, a, a great deal and all for the good in a very positive way. Um, so uh, part of the, but the high spots of my experience while I've been here have been in governing body and uh, sharing in the debates and uh, feeling a, a sense that we're contributing to the future of the church in Wales. So uh, thank you very much indeed for your, your very kind words. Um, it has been all my privilege for the time I've been here. Thank you very much indeed, Peggy. Um, we have here in the cathedral, in addition to those I've already mentioned, somebody from the IT department um, who I have dignified in the past with the nickname Santa's Little Helper. And I'm going to just to ask him for a favour. 
Is it possible to turn up the volume on this? Because I'm having difficulty hearing people speaking from Cardiff. Doesn't matter. No, not possible. They're doing their best. Right. Okay. An extra 50 pence, perhaps in the, in the, in the meter. I don't know. There we go. We move on. If I have missed out anybody who is actually retiring, I was only given notice of Peggy's retirement. But if there are any other members who will not be at the meeting in September, I'd like to thank them uh, for their service and wish them well too. We move on to item 22 on the agenda, the president's um, address, which as you will remember, uh, normally comes towards the beginning of our meeting, but we thought uh, it might be appropriate to uh, uh, bring it towards the end of today's meeting. Um, I've already made one reference in governing body already to Father Ted, uh, to which a number of us are devoted. Um, Father Larry Duff got a mention um, in relation to a barking dog. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to see if you can remember, if you are a devotee of Father Ted, uh, the Golden Cleric Award episode, where Ted went on and on and on and on. I promise you I'm not going to do that. Um, I may be just a tad longer uh, than I may have been in the past, but I hope you'll indulge me uh, on this occasion. Unless you are familiar with the history of the church in Wales, and more particularly, the debates surrounding disestablishment and the framing of the first constitution, the names of John Sankey, John Eldon Banks, Richard Atkin, and Frank Morgan might not mean a great deal to you. The first three were highly distinguished judges who, with Morgan, who was the first provincial secretary, made immense contribution to those debates and the subsequent process of disestablishment. As a footnote, uh, for those who are avid readers of the Constitution, and there are some, believe it or not, the capital initials JS, which appear in the wording of the declarations required to be made by members, for example, of the governing body, uh, the RB or, the, or a PCC, JS is John Sankey a sort of epitaph, I guess, or testament to his personal labours in the original drafting. But it's to some words of John Banks that I want to turn your attention uh, in this address. He made a speech at the 1917 convention in Cardiff at which the future post-disestablishment order of the church in Wales was discussed and agreed. And this was at a time of massive upheaval and uncertainty and need. Bear in mind that the convention was taking place whilst the First World War was raging. But in his speech, Banks set out his hopes and his vision for what the church might be and spelled out some of the characteristics which the church ought to embody. On papers circulated in advance of a joint meeting of members of the bench, the RB, and the standing committee, some of their members will already be familiar with what Banks had to say. Good things, visionary things, and worth hearing again. And so I'm now going to paraphrase some of those words. Banks declared that he hoped for, and I'll list these, a church that would be truly national, that would adapt itself to the needs and requirements of all and to the ever-changing conditions under which its work must be done. A church whose sympathy, toleration and enthusiasm would draw to itself all people and enshrine itself permanently in the affections of the inhabitants of Wales. Thirdly, a missionary church that would realize that the great bulk of our population never enter any place of worship at all and live their lives entirely untouched by religious influence. So the church he hoped would be a church that would direct its energies and resources at least as much to those sheep who need a shepherd as to those already within the fold. He hoped for a tolerant church, 
which would realize that all people are not cast in the same mold and would allow considerable latitude for differences of views and of opinion, while at the same time laying down clear and definite rules as to what is and what is not permissible. He hoped for a church which was not divided against itself and in which strife and bitterness would be unknown. A church in which people high and low, Welsh and English, would kneel down together and thank God to be part of a church large enough and broad enough to contain them all. He hoped for a church in which due provision would be made for the ministry, in which clergy would be assured of a proper and sufficient income, and a church in which the laity, both men and women, had a defined position, and in which the laity were able to accept the full responsibility of their role. In short, Banks's view of the church in Wales was that it should be faithful to Wales, adaptable and agile, properly resourced, broad in its theology, traditions, opinions, and practices, outward looking and welcoming gender equal, ethnically equal, where clergy were appropriately paid and where the role of the laity, the laos, was fully accredited and fully valued. Reading Banks's words now some 40 or so years after I first became a lay member of the governing body, and as I now prepare to retire after nearly 36 years in stipendary ministry, I have a sense that we are still some way from completing either the task or the journey that Banks envisaged. And perhaps that we have not always been sufficiently committed to making the amount of progress that we might. That, I think, you will remember, has been acknowledged from time to time in this meeting. It has only been comparatively recently in terms of our 100-year history, that we've been able to take more concrete steps to fully grasp the vision so comprehensively set out in 1917. Although, with some welcome honesty, and I think partly because a variety of circumstances have made it absolutely essential, we have certainly begun to grasp it and take such steps. Let me particularly recall from fairly recent times a governing body meeting in September 2016, which some of you will remember, the heavy heart debate. And then again in April 2017, our overt and clear commitment to making evangelism our core business. Facing the fact, perhaps, that we had sometimes been a bit too easygoing in our approach, failing to keep alive the vision that banks so clearly articulated. From some way in the more distant past, I can personally recall Canon Enid Morgan at a governing body meeting during her time as director of the Board of Mission, challenging us to walk the walk and not just talk the talk as one who by 2016 had been a diocesan bishop, a leader for some eight years, I count myself partly responsible for the failure to get Banks's vision further along the road, not always walking the walk, just talking the talk. I have some sense of real frustration, too, that some of our etern internal governance structures and our procedures remain from time to time and in some places unnecessarily clumsy, complex and slow, and that some of them are such that they can be, and in fact have been, the cause of division and hurt, as well as potentially stifling of some initiative and progress. Many of us also recognize that there is some duplication across the province, which results in poor use or even waste of resources. 
such things are now, I can say with some pleasure, not only being recognized, but are being addressed. And please, may the pace of their being addressed continue to quicken. In addition to such evident internal problems and challenges, there have been more contemporary and deeply troubling ones with an external dimension, which have had to be urgently and fully addressed. Among them, our approach to safeguarding. Although a great deal has been done to improve our policy, procedures, practice, guidelines, and training, there is much, much more to be done. This ongoing work will soon be led by a new director of safeguarding who has been selected following a series of interviews last week. And I wish him well in that role. There have been too many instances in the past where we have failed in this important area. And this has caused reputational damage to the church, but much more shamefully, devastating consequences for victims and survivors of abuse. To repeat my words from a submission we made to ICSA in recent weeks, victims and survivors have my heartfelt sorrow for those instances where the church in Wales has failed them. Although our journey has not progressed as far as might have been hoped for or indeed expected, and although there have been instances of failure, there are some real positives and a joyful sense that Banks' vision is being revived. And in our meeting now, we have heard about some evidence of that. For example, there must be joy that we are ready to recognize the reality of the weakness of our position and where we actually stand as a church in relation to our impact upon Wales as a nation and upon its people. We've heard the percentage, the tiny percentage of those with whom we are in real touch in our nation. There must be joy that although we are still rich in terms of our material, human and financial resources, we are beginning to recognize that our outreach would be better focused, better employed and better directed. And that the ordained Lone Ranger model of ministry will not bear scrutiny when set alongside the better model of shared gifts, pooled talents and working together. I'm especially pleased that the trustees of the representative body agreed in 2018 to direct a significant sum of money to the funding of imaginative and credible evangelism projects in the dioceses, the outcome of which will, I fervently hope and believe, will lead to the putting down of the roots of some sustainable long-term growth. More joy, there must be joy that both the leading of worship and the practice of pastoral care are no longer confined to those who wear these things, clerical collars. And there must be joy that our forms of worship, sacramental or otherwise, reflect a growing richness and variety and are recognizably more attractive and accessible. And again today, we heard in the paper on Times and Seasons, part three, more about that richness. One note of caution, though, and I voiced this earlier today. The most theologically correct, the most beautifully composed, and the most carefully targeted bit of modern liturgy, or indeed any liturgy, in the hands of a poor practitioner is a blunt instrument and will not do the job for which it is intended. We have an increasingly rich treasury of liturgical worship sources, both old and new, on which to draw. And as I have said in the past, those who are already trained for the kingdom's ministry or those who are in training for it 
can and should carefully employ from that treasury, either old or new, as each particular situation demands or emerges. And, and this is key, we must ensure that those into whose hands those treasures are placed are or become, through careful discernment and rigorous bespoke training, competent and confident practitioners. Recognizing that achieving this goal must take proper care and sufficient time. And on the day when, as we've heard already, the church commemorates St. Sim- Paddon, I'm pleased that our training institution has now become an integral part of our training, of our provincial structures. It must be properly supported across the province, appropriately resourced, and with careful oversight, enabled to deliver what the church asks of it. More joy. It must be joy that we are awakening to the need through better focused and accessible teaching and study to turn more and more habitual attenders or gatherers into more reverent worshippers, growing disciples, more deeply acquainted with and knowledgeable as interpreters of the fundamentals of our faith, its practices, and its scriptures. Because then they will be better equipped and more ready to go and tell others, rather than taking church life for granted while while simply waiting for those others to come. Because they won't come. Because we can seem too introvert, too uninteresting. And as again, you've heard me say from time to time, frankly, just a little bit odd. There must be joy, yes, more joy, uh, that even some meetings, often the rather diverting and time-consuming bane of our lives, some of them are growing in purpose and potential. Not all of them, but some certainly are. I record with hope that the emerging pattern of joint meetings of the bench of bishops, your standing committee, and the trustees of the RB is one such example that is to be welcomed. Welcomed, that is, as long as it results in growing trust, growing common evangelistic purpose, and growing honesty of commitment to work together for that purpose. Work together for that purpose. Meeting, for the sake of doing so, or meeting for the sake of appearing to do the right thing, won't do and won't serve any legitimate purpose, let alone the gospel. There has to be joy on a broader sense that we have a place at the table in a variety of areas of the public square where issues such as environmental danger, social justice, poverty, medical and social ethics, and other pressing issues are debated, discussed. A place at the table, not because we want to lecture people about what they ought to be doing, but because we have the capacity to contribute credibly, compassionately, and carefully in the name of him who came that all might have abundance of life. There must be joy that we admit the hurt we have caused to and are now ready to reach out to some in our midst and in our communities who have over the years been made to feel unwanted, excluded and unwelcome because we have not understood them, and because sometimes we have talked about them instead of to them. They must not be shut out or excluded any longer. Those of us who, as archbishops, have over the years had opportunities 
to address the church in Wales through its governing body. I've employed a variety of images and metaphors to attempt to encourage or awaken. And I count it a privilege and a responsibility to have had such opportunities. You forgive me, let me remind you of a few of those which I have used, some of which I hope some of you may remember and have acted on. We cannot afford to stand on the riverbank, gazing longingly across the river to the land of pure delight, as the hymn puts it, on the other side, but paralyzed by the fear of starting the journey by even putting a toe in the water. I mentioned those who play even the smallest part in the story of our church are necessary to the completeness of the story. I use the innkeeper in the parable of the Good Samaritan as an example, the one who was trusted. They're needed and they must be valued in our narrative in the harmonies of our singing the song of the gospel. I spoke about the meager offerings of fish and bread, which became immensely nourishing to so many when put into the right hands. We must place our resources, which are not meager, but which are rich, into the same hands and with the same trust. I spoke about taking the yoke and picking up the cross, being ready, <clears throat> pardon me, being ready to be guided and ready to give. And I spoke last, governing body, about the call to refresh and renew our interpretation of the song we sing to the Lord so that our worship and our life are better understood and accessible. The thread that links all those images is a call to all of us, bishops, clergy, laity, to step out, to step up, and to step across divides, remembering that although we need institutional frameworks and ways of working to enable us to function, these frameworks and ways of working must not be untouchable, unchangeable inert idols. They exist and must have as their fundamental reason for existing, enabling us to undertake and fulfill as best we can with proper resource, firm commitment and clear direction, Christ's great commission. Go and make disciples. We cannot seek to do this to step out, step up, or to step across alone. But as Paul urges in his letter to the Ephesians, we must commit to doing it together, strengthened in our inner being with power through the Spirit, Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, rooted and grounded in love. That is what gives our churches frameworks and their ways of working their meaning. That is what must be their DNA. I have been immensely grateful to have had the privilege of serving the church in Wales as a layman, a deacon, a priest, a bishop, and latterly as your archbishop. None of us ever knows whether our words, our actions or our images have encouraged or awakened a single soul, let alone a whole church. But as I now come to the end of this address at this my final meeting of the governing body, I give thanks for so much that is beginning to seem more possible, beginning to seem perhaps even more probable as set out in that vision that John Banks had for our part of Christ's church here in Wales. My prayer and my hope 
for you and for the whole church in Wales springs from those words of St. Paul that I've just quoted, that we might grow again in an ever deepening, radically inclusive love for each other and for those not yet part of us. If that might be so, Christ will accomplish through every one of you, every one of us, more than any of us can ask or imagine. To him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. I'm now going to invite um, the Bishop of Bangor, please, to take the chair uh, for the next item. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be with you from Brecon Cathedral. It's my pleasure to look after this part of our meeting, and a number of people are going to be invited to say a few words about John's ministry. And it's my great pleasure to begin by inviting and asking the indulgence, if I may, of the governing body, one name that has been absent from those uh, from whom we have sought permission or for whom we have sought permission to speak, is that of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we're now joined by the Most Reverend Justin Welby, who has worked closely with John, of course, as Archbishop of Canterbury. And I now invite him, if he is able to join us, to say a few words in relation to John's ministry. Your Grace. Thank you so much, Bishop. And uh, may I say it's a huge privilege to be invited to speak to the governing body. Um, going back in the history of your church, I think I should probably stand up uh, unlike St. Augustine when he first met the Welsh bishops. But the problem with that is then you can't see me. So if you'd excuse me, I will sit down, but it's not intended to show superiority or anything like that. Um, Archbishop John has been a member of the Anglican Communion Standing Committee uh, as a member of the Primate Standing Committee since January 2020. He was elected uh, to serve on the Standing Committee at the Primates meeting in Amman in that year, last time we met physically. As a member of the Standing Committee, uh, John received and contributed towards discussions, contributed powerfully towards discussions on the view of the Anglican Communion Office, which is the biggest shakeup of, of what has gone on there, um, really for a number of decades. And he also attended the primates meeting in Amman in January 2020, and the virtual primates meeting, which also took place last year in November when he, together with the Archbishop of York, set out the finding of the of ICSA. Um, and we also had um, uh, a joint meeting with um, uh, John, uh, with uh, the Archbishop of Armagh and the Primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church uh, in Northern Ireland in 2019 for what is with marvelous imperialism called a regional Europe primates meeting in the lead up to the postponed Lambeth conference. The fact that everyone came from these islands um, does not stop us referring to it as Europe. Um, that sort of sets up some of the, um, what he did, but of course, as in all these things, listing what people did is not only boring, but is inadequate. I think I'd want to say that um, I've really enjoyed working with John and I'm deeply grateful that he brings a number of particular talents and gifts to the life of the church. As I heard listening to most of his uh, presidential address just now, he finds um, the work of God and the joy of God in areas 
which remind us of a holistic approach to how the Holy Spirit transforms and works in the church. That sometimes it's painful, but it is still all joy. And I'm really grateful to him for that. I'm grateful to him for bringing his legal skills. I'm grateful to him for speaking powerfully for parts of the communion whose voice is not always heard and for enabling that to be heard and, and uh, making us listen. I was grateful to him for taking on being on the standing committee and also his contribution at the primates meeting in Amman in January 2020, which uh, if I can tell you a comment made afterwards, not by John, but by someone else who'd been coming to primates meetings for the thick end of 20 years, he said in an expression of absolute disbelief, I really enjoyed that meeting. And John was present at the best primates meeting that's been held probably for more than two decades and contributed to that sense of honesty and integrity that was found there of speaking truth in love. Um, I will miss him very, very much and the communion will miss him very, very much, both as a friend and as someone one could ring up and just chew over things um, as we have done on a number of issues. So John, thank you very much for your service to the Anglican Communion. Thank you for your service to the church in Wales. I am so sorry that COVID prevented the visit that was planned uh, for sometime in the last 12 months. And uh, I wish you a very, very happy retirement and the church in Wales to flourish and grow in terms of the vision that you set out from Baines in your, uh, in your presidential address. May God bless you and keep you. Um, Justin, your grace, if I may very briefly respond and thank you for your uh, kind words. You've talked, if I may say, a lot about work. But my, one of my, uh, I think, most abiding memories of you is at um, a meeting of, I think it was primates, I can't remember now, in, in Canterbury, or it may, was it, I, I really can't remember what it was, it doesn't matter. What I do remember is the morning when you and I bunked off morning prayer in the cathedral, and I was caught out by you in the breakfast queue getting to the sausages first. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember that, but I do. And anybody who then gave me a strange look having missed morning prayer, I said I breakfasted with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and that's far more important sometimes than morning prayer. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. I very much appreciate it. Um, thank you for your good wishes and every blessing to you too. Thank you, John. Bishop, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it enormously. I'm now going to ask Simon Lloyd on behalf of the national team and the office if he is also prepared to say a few words in recognition of John's ministry. Simon. Thank you, Bishop Andy. <clears throat> and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Members of the governing body will know that we've got various categories of co-option. We've just been through this process recently. And amongst them, there's the option to co-opt people, lay people, under the age of 30. The Standing Committee met, as it often does, in February in 1982. Now, that, that meeting, it considered the co-option of a young solicitor from Risker. John, I should say, such is the quality of the record keeping here, I've even been given your address at the time. <coughs> I won't give that out over the, uh, the internet. And it was a young solicitor who practiced in criminal law, one Mr. John Davis. It turns out, looking at the records, that 1982 was a very significant year for that solicitor. He commenced his training for ordained ministry later that year at St. Michael's College and was ordained deacon a couple of years later in September 1984. And that, of course, brought his membership of the governing body as a layperson to an end. However, that didn't stop uh, Mr. the now Reverend John Davis. He 
was off governing body for a few years, but then became came back as our worship coordinator and did that uh, from the early 1990s onwards. And on and off ever since, John has been a member of the governing body. It's rare and we think almost certainly unprecedented for the person who is the president of the governing body to have served it in all three orders. And similarly, it is rare for someone to clock up nearly 40 years of service to the governing body. Archbishop John, as you retire, the governing body will lose the benefit of your deep knowledge of its proceedings, your humor, your wisdom, and of course, I have to say, your anecdotes. In addition to your role with the governing body, you've also had a strong connection with the RB staff, being a regular visitor to Cathedral Road when we were there, and more recently to these offices in Callaghan Square. And when you came to see us, I always had two meeting times in mind. There was a time that was in our diaries for the meeting to start, the time when you arrived, and the actual time the meeting started. And the reason for the difference is that when every time you arrived, you did something much more important than go to a meeting. You walked all the way around the office, greeting everybody who was in. Nobody working for the central office of the church in Wales could say they didn't know its archbishop. And that, John, was hugely valued and greatly appreciated by the staff here. The staff will miss your presence. They'll miss your stories, your encouragement, and your deep interest in them as people, not just as employees. And there's one team who will miss you in particular, and that's the IT team, because you've increased their training capacity and you've increased their creativity, because they had no idea it was possible to break their equipment in the number of ways that you've managed to do it over the years. They will miss you. And you and I have worked together closely over these last four years on a number of things, some good things and some fairly challenging things. But in all of these, I've had a real sense of partnership with you, of working together in our different roles for the good of the church and in the expansion of the kingdom of God. And for me, the closeness of that working together was shown in the decision by the ICSA panel to ask us to give evidence together at the hearings in July 2019. You and I spent several hours together in the witness box, a process which the lawyers told me was, was called hot tubbing, but I seem to remember it wasn't quite as pleasurable as sitting in a hot tub. <clears throat> so we will miss you enormously. But the main thing I want to say this afternoon is thank you. Thank you, as its lay secretary, on behalf of the governing body. Thank you on behalf of the RB and its staff. And thank you from, from me personally for all we've done together, for your leadership, for your support, and for your friendship. We've been doing something behind your back, John. We've organized a collection. Now funds are still arriving and we'll leave it open for contributions until the end of April. There's an envelope with a little note in that Bishop Andy has with him and he'll pass on in a moment. So when you open the envelope, there's no money in it. There's only a promise of money in the future. And some might say that's fairly typical of the RB, but I do promise the money. Will be <coughs> so for now, just a card, but a huge thank you to you from the GB, from the RB and its staff, and a thank you from me. Thank you, Simon. That was much appreciated. John, I wonder if I could ask you just to sit down for a moment. I'm going to need you back in a bit. Oh, right. if you will take a seat. I'd be most <laughs> grateful. It now comes to me on behalf of all of us to say a few words about John on behalf of bishops, uh, but on behalf of the whole church. John David Edward Davis is the ninth bishop of the Diocese of Swansea and Brecon, and the first archbishop to serve from that diocese. It's my good fortune today to say a few words in appreciation of his ministry on behalf of us all. John was ordained deacon in September 1984 in St. Wallace Cathedral 
to serve a title as assistant curate in Chepstow, priesthood the following year. Having trained originally as a solicitor, specialising in criminal law, we could mull on that a little, I suspect. He moved seamlessly into parochial ministry, serving a further title as curate in charge of Michaelstown, Avedu, and Rudry before appointments as rector of Bedwas with Rudry and then vicar of St. John the Evangelist in Mandy, Newport. His love and affection for the Diocese of Monmouth have been maintained. So too, his knowledge of the best eating and watering establishments appreciated by the bench immensely over a number of years. In 2000, John was invited to accept the position of Dean of Brecon, in which he served for eight years, accepting additional churches to his cure in that time. This appointment not only provided the cathedral with an experienced priest with all of the interpersonal skills we know so well, but it allowed the worship of the cathedral to develop to new high standards. The offices of which he remains so fond and to which he is so deeply committed were and are the backbone of cathedral worship and prayer. And those of us who know John well know him in his way of reciting by rote some of his favourite collects, especially from Evensong. In addition, John succeeded in securing new funding streams for the music department and, of course, had occasion to sate his own love of playing a very fine cathedral organ. You may not know, he is a very fine cathedral organist as well as maintaining oversight of an ancient and beautiful building, his ministry to the city, to the armed forces and local institutions won him respect and admiration. Unsurprising, therefore, that in 2008, John was elected Bishop of Swansea and Brecon and moved with Kate, Christopher and Joe to Ely Tower, which has been their home since that time. In 2017, John was elected once more, now as Archbishop of the Province of Wales, and has overseen the life of the Church in that time as Metropolitan, President of the Governing Body, and first among Episcopal colleagues. As John retires from stipendiary ministry, moving to Ryder, we want to wish him, Joe, Kate, and Christopher every happiness in their new home, in a town and in a community he knows well. And I want to stay with Joe, Kate and Christopher, if I may, because in the line of thanks, we should begin with you. Being a public figure, a leader in community can be demanding and relentless, I think. And when the times have been their busiest and the challenges most pressing, you are the ones who've not only felt the pinch of time, but seen the costs to someone that you love so much. And so I want to thank all of you for your bearing us and your bearing John, holding him up, keeping him sane most of the time giving him belief that somehow all of this was worthwhile and in the service of someone whom to serve brings, as he's reminded us today, yes, pain, but also joy. Joe, Christopher and Kate from the church in Wales. Thank you, all of you. John, in your time as bishop, the church in Wales has undergone the most significant structural changes since the Second World War. More recently, the corona coronavirus pandemic has brought before it perhaps its greatest material challenge. And like other dioceses, the Diocese of Swansea and Brecon has sought to respond to an ever increasing speed of change while remaining firm and true to the inheritance of faith. And your articulation of gathering, growing and going has captured in a convincing way the heart 
of the gospel, the universal call to be in communion with God, to walk further with Christ, to bear witness to the hope which we have. You have repeatedly preached on the Great Commission, upon the need for wise and passionate engagement with Scripture. Thank you today for commending the motion on biblical literacy at this governing body. And you have reminded us that new things, much to be welcomed, are always rooted and draw on the faith vouched safe to us by our mothers and fathers before us. You have been resident that we are part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And in your life and your ministry as a bishop, you have lived this out. And so as a bishop of the church, then, I want to thank you for your energy, for your wisdom and your resolve on behalf of the church in Wales. Thank you. As Archbishop, you have needed to do the impossible, keeping your colleagues happy, herding cats comes to mind. But this so public ministry has been offered to our nation as well. You have chaired Christian Aid Wales for nine years. You have been chair of the Steering Committee of Housing Justice Cymru for six years. You have spoken to, with, and sometimes against those who share in the public space of national life, whether government or other agency, always with courtesy, always with dignity and clarity. And that outward focus that you've commended to us so often has meant the church in Wales continues to hold the respect and affection of national leaders and secular institutions. As colleagues, especially in the loss of most of the centenary celebrations, we have been conscious that you've needed to hold a space which has been challenging for the whole church. In this time, you have been the steady, unflappable leader that we knew you would be. But into the mix, you have poured your personal warmth, your wonderful wit, your superb storytelling ability, and your huge positivity, personal traits that have been perhaps most needed and most important in this time. We owe you a debt of gratitude for standing in the gap. And for that, the whole of the church in Wales is profoundly grateful. In a moment, I have something to present to you, and then I will ask you, Archbishop, to bless us. But before I do that, let us be clear. Let me be clear. This is not an occasion of shades lengthening. The evening has not come. The busy world is not hushed. The fever of life, I regret to say, remains. And your work is not done. This is another step along a journey. In our baptism, we became Christ's own. And in our ordinations, we pledged to serve him. Neither of these has boundary nor end, at least not this side of the grave. And so it is for today and the future that we now commit you in the words of a Christian many, many moons ago, that you might be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the fullness of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. John, thank you. Firstly, I made mention in my comments that there was something for Joe, and I want to ask, these can now be brought forward, and if Joe and the children, you would join me here, just for a moment.
First of all, say it with flowers, as of course we must. Secondly, something from Episcopal College, which I ask you to keep on behalf of John and yourself. We came to know that John was fond of steam trains rather surreptitiously. And so in this little box here, a good weekend for the two of you when time allows, plus a foot plate experience on a choo-choo train. Yeah. And I have already agreed with IT to cover the event <laughs> in full. Thank you. I will. <laughs> These gifts which we offer are added to with one particular, which Paul is now going to bring forward. And John, perhaps you might come and receive this yourself. Something to take away with you, um, which will remind you of a place that is very dear to you. It's all wrapped up, so I suggest you unwrap it so that everyone can really see. I think so. It's been a great deal of conspiracy to make all of this happen. Um, as a criminal lawyer, you should be proud of us. Yeah. I'm actually in the real thing, of course, at the moment. But that, um, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Very well, much indeed. You're very welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you'd like to join me in wishing John well, uh, let us show our, our appreciation in the usual way, even if at a distance. We give John a round of applause. I'll hand back to you, yeah, sure. Thank you very much indeed. Well, how wonderful. Thank you all very much indeed. And for all the conspiracy that's been going on behind the scenes, um, I'm actually very grateful and I, I'm very, very touched. Um, mention was made by Simon of the frequency and the skill with which I was able to break IT. Um, equipment. That's true. I'm not very good uh, with it. Um, and I have been promised, it is going to come, is it? Is it, does, it does, does this book exist? Yes. Or have I been wound up? Does it exist? Right. I'm told that there is a book called um, IT for Dummies, yes. which the IT department are going to buy for me. Leon Hughes had the temerity to tell me that there was another edition being published called IT for mature dummies. Um, I will wreak revenge in some way or another at some point uh, in the future. But my friends, um, uh, many kind words have been spoken. Some of them, I have to say, uh, I don't really recognize uh, myself in them, but I'm very, very grateful uh, to all of you. And thank you um, for working out just how long I been on the GB, as I said, as you always been said on and off. I thought it was about 40 years, um, but uh, it, it is pretty close to 40 years. Um, but the meeting of the GB is not yet over because I have still a little more work uh, to do in relation to the agenda. I now lost my agenda paper. I think the Bishop of Bangor has stolen it. Is that mine or is that yours? Does make any difference? I don't think. One of the things that I always do, and archbishops always do at the end of a governing body meeting, is to say thank you. And one of the things that I have always endeavoured to do when saying thank you is to make the point that we don't say thank you just for the sake of saying it, just to be well-mannered or courteous. There is an enormous amount of work that goes into preparation uh, for a governing body meeting. 
And that's, I, I think, even more so at the present time, given the circumstances through which we are living. So it's absolutely essential that I say uh, a very, very warm word of thanks to all the IT technical staff, uh, to Leon, um, who, dare I say, masterminded, I don't know, should we say masterminded, is that the kind? Ryan is nodding and saying, yeah, give, him, give him a break. Um, Leon, uh, Mike, Paul, Alex, Ryan, Jonathan, and Brad, who help in so many ways behind the scenes uh, to make things run very smoothly. Tidir, our indefatigable translator. One day, Tidir, you must tell me what the Welsh for indefatigable is. Is a challenge, I suppose, is it? Yeah. You have been made use of, if I can put it like this, at this meeting. There have been a number of contributions in Welsh. And for those who have spoken in Welsh, thank you very much indeed for doing so. Those, um, I, it says here, those who have acted as chairs of the sessions, well, that been me. So thank you to me for being a chair. But thank you to Canon Stephen Kirk, who chaired uh, the governing body uh, today. Uh, somebody remarked, I can't remember after which meeting it was, it was one of our first online meetings, uh, that he and I had operated rather like the two Ronnies. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, working with Stephen in that way. So for your chairmanship, uh, Stephen, your very careful and thoughtful chairmanship, uh, I'm very grateful. Paul McNess stepping into the breach for this meeting to act as our worship coordinator. Thank you. Um, Archdeacon Mike, uh, Canon Marianne and Canon Dullum for leading worship today. Even Dullum, when you went offline, things didn't fall apart. And to those who also took part in worship, uh, well done. Thank you for all of that. Um, highlights, which um, will cover the business of the governing body meeting should be available on the website within about uh, two weeks of today. And as I've said before, do please encourage people who are non-members of governing body um, to uh, go onto the website and take a look at highlights. Then from a personal perspective, if you will again indulge me, a couple more uh, words of thanks. To my Episcopal colleagues, we, despite what people uh, may say, uh, we don't always agree. There's not always a common agenda. Uh, but we do, even when we disagree, I hope, try to do the right thing within the confines of the circumstances prevailing. We do try to do our best. And so I want to thank uh, my Episcopal colleagues, both past, present and past, because one or two have dropped off the perch during my time uh, on the bench. So uh, with hindsight to them, thanks also. Simon Lloyd has spoken about the close way uh, in which he and I have tried to work uh, together. I'm very grateful to him for his personal support um, and um, his affection. Uh, it took him a little while to get used to the screen's gone. Does that mean it's all gone off? I'm going to carry on talking on the assumption that people are still able to hear. So, yes, yeah, Simon has spoken about the way in which we work together. It did take him a little while to get used to some of my language. Um, and he did at one point mention that in the little office at Callaghan Square where we met, he was thinking of introducing a swear box. Um, uh, the fact that the room hasn't been used very much lately means there's probably very little in it. But Simon, whatever is in it, uh, would you please pass it on to the centenary fund? It might go a little way uh, to boosting that. I'd be very grateful to you personally for all the support and advice that, that you've given. And I do hope that the members of the team at the provincial office will forgive me uh, if I do single out one person from there, uh, in addition to Simon, who I want to thank. And that's John Richfield. Um, John was around when I became a member of the governing body 40 years ago, and he's still there now. He doesn't appear to me to have aged a day. So I'd like to know what cream he's using, because I certainly have over those years. Uh, but he's so much 
behind the scenes as well at governing body with the arrangements. I want to single him out for a word of thanks, and I hope others will excuse my doing that. I know others are very grateful to John for all that he does. Unless this turn into the Golden Cleric Award, I have only one more person to thank. A person who is completely anonymous. Some of you will know from past governing body meetings that for a number of years now, on my table at the meeting hall in Lampeter and subsequently elsewhere, before I became Archbishop, bottles of beer appeared. I have absolutely no idea who has been the supplier of those bottles of beer. This meeting, I've had two bottles of beer. The first, which I'm assuming came from my anonymous benefactor, arrived about 10 days ago. It was wrapped like a tactical nuclear missile. I've never seen so much bubble wrap. Cardboard box, lots of tape, and masses of bubble wrap. And I can assure you, it was absolutely intact and quickly consumed. But another member of the governing body, alert to the fact that because we were still meeting at a distance, alert to the fact that I might not get my bottle. And when we met in Bristol, it arrived. So that narrowed the field down a bit, I suppose. Another member of the governing body, fearing that I might not get my bottle, sent his wife to Ely Tower yesterday and delivered a second bottle. And that will be consumed this evening. So there we are, my friends. We are at the end of our meeting and at the end of my time on the governing body. With lots and lots of thanks to all of you for your fellowship, your support, and your humor over the years. My last act now is to invite you just to turn to stillness, as I so often do, before uh, I pronounce the blessing. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.